I'm sure none of you have done something with a computer where it says, you want to back up? And you say, oh, i got time, so sure, I'll back up. And all of a sudden, it changed everything on this computer. I messed up. So guys that come up here and work on this, I'll get it fixed. <laughs> I backed up to my OneDrive, and it switched to my desktop at home, and it messed everything up here, so we'll have to renew it. But uh, we are on Lesson 13 in the study of Isaiah, so I would like to encourage you to uh, turn in your Old Testaments there, Isaiah chapter 28 is where we're going to begin uh, in our 13th lesson in just a few moments. And I uh, just want to remind you that we, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have my notes with me. I knew I was missing something. I didn't use my uh, device the first hour because I taught a text just from the Word and and utilized it alone, all my side notes that I've got scribbled in my Bible. But uh, uh, we uh, typically have review questions for each lesson, and we almost finished the previous lesson, which was the sixth one, if you count down in the table of contents, which covered uh, chapters 13 through 27 in our discussion. But we didn't finish all of the, uh, we really didn't go through the questions. And so I've got four that I'm going to use as review material uh, to begin our time together today. Uh, from the previous lesson, and then the seventh lesson, if you walk, go down, they're not numbered, but if you, you go down beginning with chapter uh, 28, going through chapter 35 is what we're going to begin discussing today. It'll take a week or two to get through that, probably several weeks at least, two weeks, maybe three. Uh, but we'll start off with the review questions in just a few moments' time, so if you bow with me, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin our, our study. Dear Father in heaven, as we come before you at this time, we are grateful that you are our God grateful for all the blessings that we enjoy in our lives. And especially at this time, dear Father, we're, we're thankful for the spiritual blessings that we receive through your Son, including in the recognition of, of his covenant, his kingdom, his sacrifice, his resurrection from the dead, the hope of life that we enjoy. Dear Father, we are aware, as we've studied already, the book of Isaiah gives us many messianic prophecies that prove that he is the one. We pray as we go through this study that you would help us to enlarge our understanding of, of the scheme of redemption, but also how you deal with nations and how you have dealt with both Israel and Judah in the past as well as other nations. And dear Father, we pray that these things will give us the understanding that we need to better live our lives before you. Forgive us of the sins that we commit from time to time. We pray, dear Father, that you bless the worship that will follow in the third hour. And we ask these things in your son's precious name. Amen. All right. Uh, again, lesson uh, 13. We've had 12 up to this point. So this is our 13th lesson we're talking about. And going through the material that we covered last week, there are several um, questions that I want to ask to kind of start us off today. The first one is the suggested theme that is found in that lesson as uh, the theme of the chapters 13 through 27. It's kind of a, I would say, the, the most major division. We talked about the major divisions being the Assyrian uh, division or portion of the book, which uh, period which takes place in the first 39 chapters and then the Babylonian in chapters 40 to 66. What is the theme that we covered as we looked at those discourses? Okay. So the various, so these, these, uh, these world empires that, that we're talking about, uh, this was a time of great evil in the world in general. And, and so it included not only Assyria or not only Israel or not only Judah, but also a number of the nations round about. And you may remember that it was referred to as burdens uh, in the New King James uh, the Greek word is, uh, or the, excuse me, the Hebrew word is also noted as being an oracle, uh, which basically is a message of doom or judgment that is put upon the various nations. And uh, so that's, that's the primary idea. The theme is the prophecies that, that Isaiah gives <coughs> concerning the evil nations and the judgment that God would bring upon them at that particular time. Question number two is found in chapter 13 and verse 17 that refers to God's judgment against Babylon. The question is, whom will God stir up against Babylon as part of this judgment? So what does chapter 13 and verse 17 indicate? Okay. 
Don't all speak up at the same time. <laughs> I was looking at it. With, let me let me look to make sure that the that, that the actual reference. Sometimes the in the notes the references get changed. But uh, chapter thirteen and and verse seventeen uh, of that is um, says, "Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them." Against this has reference to Babylon. Who will not regard silver, and as for gold, they will do not, not delight in it. A very warring nation, um, and more concerned about power than they were about, about money, <laughs> about valuables, but uh, the Medes. And uh, you remember the Persian um, uh, Mede Empire that, uh, that overtook uh, the Babylonian Empire in the vision that Daniel. Uh, Daniel related uh, the interpretation of to King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the head of gold in that vision. And then there would be an inferior kingdom they referred to as the Medes and the Persians. Um, kind of they had a, a, a civil agreement in regard to the, the world empire that they covered. But uh, Cyrus, the first king, the Medes are the ones that overtook the Babylonians. So we need to keep that in mind. What we're trying to do is, in addition to going through the prophecies is remind you of the actual... Um, the actual great empires, because there is something to be noted from Daniel chapter 2 uh, that begins. The Assyrian kingdom predated Daniel, and that's the first part of this chapter. But you'll remember in uh, beginning in, in chapter 13 and going through 27, when he talks about the oracles, the judgments, they were not necessarily in chronological order, and they weren't necessarily going to happen immediately. And so just by whatever reason... Uh, he gave his burden or oracle against the Babylonian Empire before he did the Assyrians. The Assyrians were second in that list. But with regard to the Babylonians, he said the Medes would come, which, of course, was alluded to in the, in the uh, offering of the, um, um, the interpretation of Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar. And as we go back through secular history, it's well, well documented that the Babylonian Empire fell as a result of the incursion of the Medes and the Persians. And so they were the next great, great empire mentioned at that time. Third question, uh, from chapter 24, verses 19 through 23. So if you'll turn over there, chapter 24, verses 19 through 23. I'm going to read there because it talks about the calamities upon the earth. He says the earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it. It will fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones. And on the earth, the kings of the earth, they will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in the prison. After many days, they will be punished. The moon will be disgraced, the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. So the question is this, and again, we've read it, but when the earth is shaken, the moon and the sun dis disgraced, what would the Lord do? What is it it says in the latter part of that verse that the Lord would do? Reign on his throne in Zion, correct? As is stated in the latter part of verse 23. The Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. Understand again uh, the messianic, messianic nature of the kingdom and, and the one uh, to whom the um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, credit. So the one to whom the credit will be given for the accomplishment of this kingdom. The messianic kingdom is one that would break into pieces all the other nations. It would be the nation that would, that would persist and live forever or exist forever. And the Lord God is the one who gets the credit for that because even when we look at this particular context, the heavens and the earth quake, the sun and the moon are disgraced, God has power even over the elements of nature. And, um, and so when you see the effect, ineffectual nature of some of the pagan gods and the limits of their powers, uh, you don't see that with regard to Jehovah. Uh, he's, he's different in kind than the pagan gods that they were following from time to time. The Lord, he is God. You remember in, in 1 Kings chapter 18 with regard to the um, he, uh, challenge that Elijah put out. If Baal is God, follow him. 
If the Lord Jehovah is God, follow him. And the people didn't answer until they got the demonstration of it. But, but we are told that Jehovah, I mean, you, you, you water down the altar and you, you fill the trenches with water and it's completely and totally soaked and then, and then fire comes down at the behest of Elijah from heaven and God demonstrates his power by not only burning the sacrifice, but burning the altar, licking up all the water from the trenches. I mean, it was complete and total demonstration of God's omnipotence. And, and that affects every aspect of our existence. So it's a, it's a good thing to keep in mind. It's just the power of God and the fact that he is behind everything. Which we'll get into in our chapter today when we talk about what Jerusalem was trying to do. Make political alliances rather than trusting in God. And they did not have that in their mind. And there was a reason for this. And we'll get into it a little bit later. The fourth question is what is said in chapter 26 and verses 3 through 4. So I'll let you read uh, chapter 26, 3 through 4, a very short passage, uh, and ask, answer this question. What is said of those who trust in the Lord? What is said concerning those who trust in God rather than political alliances or in themselves or in what the world can offer them? He will grant them everlasting strength, and they will have what? We talked about it in our first hour, didn't we? Peace, that reconciliation, that perfect reconciliation comes as a result of, of what we have done in trusting in the Lord. So it's a, it's a good lesson for us to keep in mind because when you look at these, and that's what I'm trying to do is kind of get big themes or, or applicable uh, thoughts that come out of these questions, how applicable they are to us to remember that Jehovah God is omnipotent, to remember what happens if we trust in him, as, as well as the historical things that we're talking about uh, in, in these things. Anybody have any questions about what we've discussed in chapter, or lesson six, in chapters 13 through 27 before we go on to the next section? Okay, so if you do have the material um, uh, with you, and if, if, if not, let me know and we can, we can add some others if you would like to have them. Um, but most of you do have it. But we're talking again um, in uh, getting into chapter set, or excuse me, lesson number seven, chapters 28 through 35 of the text. And you'll notice up on the page at the beginning of that lesson, there are uh, two objectives that are mentioned in, in studying this section. The first one is to review the messages that Isaiah delivered when Israel and Judah were being threatened by Assyria. So, Again, it's important that we recognize and remember the, uh, the historical aspect of what actually happened. There are uh, relation, uh, relating of these kinds of things in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, but uh, with regard to the Assyrians, uh, we find that the Assyrian Empire was successful in taking Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, into captivity, but was not fully successful in taking the southern kingdom of Judah into captivity, though... There was a great deal of distress and chastisement uh, from uh, Assyria uh, through the hand of God because of the evil that was in Judah as well. So do keep that in mind and, uh, and remember as we uh, alluded to at the beginning of our study uh, 12 weeks ago and as we've touched upon a few times, the first 39 chapters deal with the Assyrian captivity, so that's the first world empire, and then the second empire, and this has to do with the chronology as what what Isaiah is dealing with, but the second is the Babylonian Empire in chapters 40 through chapter 66. The second thing to note with regard to this is the condemnation that comes from seeking help from Egypt instead of looking to the Lord for deliverance. And I wanted just to spend a few moments talking about that because I think that is another principle that we can apply to our lives daily because we have those same tendencies. Uh, I had an opportunity to to study with, with one particular individual who basically was doing that. He was somewhat frustrated that what he was wanting was not being fully accomplished, but what he was doing was, was seeking to gain alliances and, and accomplish things without, without really having God as, as first in his life. And I'm not going to say that, that people can't be successful doing that because they certainly can all of the time, but the happiness, the sense of fulfillment, the sense of... Of, of having your life right was not there because that hasn't been his impetus, uh, placing his trust in God. 
And, uh, and, and we have promises, for example, as Christians in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, this coming from the Lord himself, if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the needful things having reference to our sustenance and what we need to exist on this earth, God says those will be supplied. We certainly as, as Christians, as brethren, have uh, benefits that, uh, that accrue to us as a result of our relationship as Christians. Uh, for example, benevolence, uh, benevolent needs uh, sometimes can be fulfilled by other Christians, and that's kind of God's plan for us to help one another in regard to this. But, but the fact is God's providence helps those who place their trust in him. And, um, and, and it's an amazing thing how, how seldom it is that we keep that in mind. How much we worry, anxiety comes as a result of it. But Israel and Judah, time and time again, God had just demonstrated his power. It came the, through the wilderness wanderings. It came as they entered into Canaan. And there was always, well, why did you let us lead us out? And then this happens. You allow this to happen. Remember what, uh, what they said, no, no food to eat, no water to drink. Grumbling because the Egyptians were, were coming up from behind and their backs were against the wall with regard to the Red Sea. You have, uh, you have Joshua as the people went over the land. This great victory over Jericho, but the very next little city of, of Ai defeated the Israelites. Why, God, did you allow this to happen? And there's always that, 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 that blaming of God about these kinds of things because they're placing their trust in themselves and they're concerned about, about what things look like instead of just trusting into God. And, and, of course, the allegiances that they do with Egypt and Assyria and, and that with, the, with the, the southern kingdom of Judah, these are examples of that kind of thing instead of putting their trust in God. Yes, Rule? That's a good point. Yeah, and that's, that's something that I've, I've been talking about some with, it's with regard to authority, and, and we talked about it as well, God's part, man's part, uh, in our, our discussion in the first hour. But the, this whole principle is we trust in God, or we should trust fully in Him. Uh, we do what we are supposed to do in order to please Him, but, but it all is dependent upon Him, which is why it's not going to fail at all. In, in regard to these things, we will have what we need, and ultimately that is eternity in the presence of God. There's a passage in Romans chapter 8. This is the mindset that we ought to have in verse 31. It's my favorite uh, scripture. I say that time and again. There are others that I have that are favorites, but I love this passage. What can we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He didn't spare his own son. He delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him all freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. In other words, someone says, you guys are evil. Well, God's on our side. He's the one that's justifying us. So what you have to say has nothing to do with it. So who is it who condemns? It's Christ who dies. So if Christ is on our side, he's risen, he makes, is at the right hand of God making intercession for us, there's nothing anyone can do to condemn us. And words of condemnation should not bother us at all because the one who is saying, hey, you're justified, or I'm going to make sure that you're acceptable to God. Well, it's Christ. He's the one that died for us. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? We're killed all day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. But in these things, all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
And, and I could go on because I love the whole, the whole passage, but that's the, the point that is being made, is it not? And, and so we go back, and we can go back and, and just explain this as a what if. What if Judah and Israel had maintained their allegiance to God? They had utterly driven out all of the, of the inhabitants because their heart was right always before God. The Philistines were driven out, and the and Amorites, were driven, all of them were driven out of the land, and, uh, and as a result of that, uh, through the entirety of their existence until Christ came, <laughs> they remained faithful to God. They didn't, didn't go after idols. They didn't disobey. The people were always righteous and always good. Of course, that's a big what if, isn't it? Because it didn't happen anything like that. But God would have always, always blessed them. God would have always protected them. God would have always been, been this beneficent, loving God who cares for and who blesses his people because they would have been deserving of it. They would not have changed. The seeking of alliances wouldn't happen. What, what if everybody acted like David did? And you have all of the people of Israel who were, who were afraid of Goliath. And then this kid comes along who can't even carry the armor of Saul because it's too large and too heavy for him. He goes out and he meets Goliath in the field of battle Goliath just makes fun of him because he's just a, a young kid, but he said, listen, you're going to die, and you're going to die not because of me, because God has determined it. His trust entirely was on God, not upon... I mean, he had a couple of rocks and a sling, and he had ability, but that he knew that, that his, 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 uh, his uh, direction was going to be true, his aim was going to be true. He knew... That, that he would have the head of Goliath, and he knew it not because of anything that he was capable of doing, but rather God was with him. And so he didn't have to make alliances. He didn't have to try to, to set the table to where it works out the way he wants it to work out. He just had to trust in God. And in trusting in God, that's exactly what happened. And so that's ultimately what we, what we need to learn with regard to that as well. Your life may not turn out the way you want your life to turn out. You may not have as much money. You may not have the day-to-day -day security that you think that you need to have. But in the end of your life, if you live first for him and concern yourself fully for him, you're going to have an eternity in his presence, and you're going to get by on this earth because God has promised that you're going to get by. And as a result of that, don't try to make those alliances trusting God in sin. Yes, Justin. That's a good point. And, and I, I do want you to note that we understand how hard it is. There is that recognition. I think that we do have an advantage in Hebrews chapter 11. Those who were, um, who were described in that Halcyon Hall of Faith as being uh, heroes, uh, that, that group, they managed to do what they did in remaining faithful to God and keeping their mind on God, despite the fact they saw through a veil darkly. Uh, but we have that great crowd of witnesses in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, it tells us. So we, as we have the witnesses and we have the examples, it should be somewhat easier for us. It's still a challenge, but it should be easier because we see what God has done in the past and know that he's going to do it for us as well. So we've got an advantage. And we need to keep that in mind, and, and hopefully that will help us in our, our mindset as we live day by day. But look at it like Jesus looks at it, as Justin indicated, rather than, than trying to machinate and figure it out and do it on your own. God needs to be a part of that. Okay, so with regard to those, those two things, with regard to the, we're going a little slow today, but I did want to get into just chapter 28. You'll notice in the summary um, that we have on the page, there is an overview of chapters 28 through 35 that are mentioned. A couple of things we'll note about that. Uh, the messages in the section seem to relate mostly to the approaching calamities that will come because of the Assyrian invasion, the establishment of the Syrian Empire. And we're told here that during the reigns of Ahaz and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah, 
we have that Shalmaneser, Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria first, was the one that came to Israel. And he was the one that was responsible for taking the Israelites away captive. So again, we've got the two kingdoms. We've got the, the, Israelis, uh, the Israel king, Israelites, the, the northern kingdom of Israel, and then the southern kingdom of Judah that had been divided, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, or yeah, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, as, we, as we've indicated previously. But now we're told at this particular time in this division, Israel had been taken completely into idolatry. And in 2 Kings 17 and verse 6, 2 Kings 17 and verse 6, we are told that in the ninth year of the king of Israel, Hosea, uh, we are told that the king of Assyria took Samaria, that was the capital city of Israel, and carried Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Halal and by the Haber, the river of Gozan, and the cities of the Medes. So the Medes were not yet ascendant. But this is something that Assyria did. Not all the empires did this, but the Assyrians did. When they come in and they would conquer a people, just as the Babylonians, they would take them away into captivity. So when you hear about Assyria captivity as it relates to Israel, this is what's being taught. They were able to take the land and basically empty out the land of the, of the majority of the Assyrians and, and take them to another place, resettle them to another place. Now there was a reason for this, why... Uh, there were efforts made to do it. If you have a displaced people um, who have been defeated, they're going to be more malleable and, and easier to control if they, aren't, if they don't have access to what they have uh, become familiar with and, and what they hold is dear. And so uh, they were taken away and others were, were taken or brought in. Uh, we're told uh, a bit later that the Assyrians... Uh, the uh, Israeli land was inhabited by Babylon, uh, by Kutha, by Ava, Hamath, and Sepharavim. Uh, Sepharavim, I guess is how you pronounce that word. But, uh, so, so other peoples from other places were brought in to Israel, and you had just kind of this flip-flop. Um, and all of them were displaced, and that was a military tactic to, to in some way consolidate their reign by displacing these people from their land. So that's why it is said that they were taken away into captivity there in 2 Kings chapter 17. Now, why was that? We've already talked about this to a pretty great extent. Israel was basically captured by idolatry. It was guilty of idolatry, and God had warned them. But when you go to 2 Kings 17 and verse 18, uh, we're told that when he warned them, they stiffened their necks, and they would not hear him. 2 Kings 17, 18 he became very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. So this was God's chastisement upon Israel, judgment upon Israel as a result of their idolatry, as a result of the sins. Now God did deal a bit differently with the Jews, both, both kingdoms were primarily Judah, but, but he dealt differently with the Jews in the judgment because it was not total as contrasted with the other nations, because they were his chosen people. Rebellious, and yet he is the one who chose them from the beginning, that through them the Messiah would come, the Messianic kingdom would come. And as we have stated time and again, the, uh, the seed is in the stump, so the remnant that would return, the Messianic kingdom would come from that. And, uh, and so we, we want to keep those, those kinds of things in mind with regard to the judgment against, against Israel. But you'll notice again in the, uh, uh, the summary... Uh, we are told that uh, in the 14th year of Hezekiah, who was the king of Judah, that Sennacherib, and that's how you pronounce it. I, I find, <laughs> I'm sorry, and I even have, to have trouble remembering it. Sennacherib or Sennacherib? It's Sennacherib. It's always Sennacherib. If I ever say Sennacherib again, just raise your hand. You don't have to say anything. I know I messed up. But it's Sennacherib, and it was Sennacherib's prism, of course, that had that, uh, that discourse of Sennacherib against Hezekiah, the king of Judah, that we looked at last, last week. But it was during that time of Hezekiah that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, the new king of Assyria, or the, the next king of Assyria, sought to do the same thing with Judah that was done with Israel. And that's found in, the, in 2 Kings in chapter 18. And here is the question that comes. What was Judah to do? Um, what Were they to surrender to the Assyrians? Um, to put their trust in an alliance with Egypt, which is what they did? Uh, come to the south, help us, Egypt. Uh, or were they to put their trust in God? That was Isaiah's message. And I wanted to read uh, that in chapter 30. It becomes clear in chapter 30. Just one short passage there in chapter 30, verses 1, looking at this overview. 
verses 1 through 3 of Isaiah 30. Now notice what God said. He said, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of me. You see what he's saying? They're taking advice. They're looking for a way out, but they aren't looking to God for it. They devise plans, but not of my spirit. So their plans were to gain allegiances, political alliances, but not of my spirit. And they add sin to sin. They walk to go down to Egypt. They have not asked my advice. To strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame. And trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. So Isaiah had the message. Just people, and, and he was told, preach the message. How long do you preach it? Well, just keep preaching it because they're not going to accept it. They're going to deny it. It's not going to help. But preach it anyway because there was the witness of God against Israel and the witness of God against Judah as a result of these things. All right, any, any question about the survey or summary up to that point? Like I said, what we're basically following in these lessons is the summary uh, will, the outline we're not going to cover, but that will be accessible to you in the material so that if you have some, some questions about any particular points, you can certainly find it there. And then we'll look over some of the review questions as well. But uh, we're getting now into chapter uh, 28 and 29. There are a few points that I want to make. I think our, our time will be gone uh, by finishing this material in the 28th chapter. We'll pick up with chapter 29 next week. But you'll notice here that chapters 28 and 29 reveal the Lord's design, first of all, for Ephraim, which is another word that is used for Israel, and then Ariel, which is another word that, that is used by Isaiah with regard to Jerusalem. So the first thing to note is this complete destruction of Israel and the statement that Ephraim's crown of pride would fade. And there is an allusion to this, specifically the crown of pride in Isaiah 28 in verses 1 and 2. So looking at the first couple of verses of Isaiah 28, he says, Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim. And notice how he characterizes them. And of course, there seems to be, in this particular case, not just a symbolic drunkenness that is under consideration in this case. In fact, there is a reference in Isaiah 28 in verse 7 to the fact that the leaders of the people were intoxicated by wine. I think there really was a problem with drink and bad decisions that were being made as a result of, of, of the, um, the intoxication the lack of sobriety on the part of the religious leaders here. But he says, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim. Their glorious beauty is a fading flower. So here we're a, a proud nation, but you're fading. It's the head of the Verton Valleys to those who are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord has a mighty and strong one, like a tempest of hell and a destroying storm, like a flood of mighty waters overflowing, who will bring them down to the earth with his hand. So we've already established the greatness of God. And we've established we cannot withstand God because of his omnipotence and uh, because even the earthquakes at it. But here they are. They're, they're making their choices. They're, 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 they're proud and they're intoxicated and everything is what they think that it ought to be through their own good and through their own power. And yet it's going to fade because God is going to bring it to an end. The way God did it, he utilizes other other uh, nations. That's, that's what he has done throughout history. And so the Assyrians would come in. And then the Assyrians would get judged. And the Assyrians were worse than the Israelites. I, I will not deny that that is the case. Uh, it was worse in that marauding nation than it was in Israel. But, but Israel was the one that God was going to deal with first. And then he would deal with the Assyrians after that happened. So, uh, but with that in mind, notice verse 5 of the text. Uh, the glory of the remnant. In that day the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty. So you'll find the crown of pride that is stated in verse 1, but when God comes and he chastises the people, he will be the crown of glory and diadem of beauty to the remnant. And so the, the ones who would return, the ones who remain faithful to him, the few, that even though Israel was destructed, and wasn't it destructed completely? There is, there is no uh, firm history with regard to the nation um, existing any, any time beyond the Assyrian captivity. That's not to say that every 
uh, one who was in the northern kingdom of Israel was unfaithful to God or that they all were lost. Here there is an indication of a remnant that would return just as the remnant from Judah returned from Babylonian captivity that we have recorded in Nehemiah and Ezra and, and places like that in, in the scripture. But I love that passage in verse, 20, uh, verse 5 of chapter 28. In that day, the very day that the crown of pride of Israel fades and the cataclysm against Israel because of their ungodliness is, is, uh, is, is accomplished by the Lord, the Lord's going to replace this pride and this, this crown with his own, uh, a diadem of beauty, to his people, because he does not forget his people, the ones who are faithful to him. Okay, questions about that? Because there is a point that I want to make, that it's an aside, and, and, and I wanted to spend probably most of the rest of our time talking about it. Um, we are told in verse 7 of the text, one of the reasons why Israel erred. We talk about the idolatry, that is the emphasis we place on it a lot. But notice verse 7 of the text, I alluded to this a moment ago. He said, they have erred through wine. And through intoxicating drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They're swallowed up by wine. They're out of the way through intoxicating drink, err in vision, and stumble in judgment. Now, isn't that a good lesson for us to learn as Christians? Shouldn't we be a sober people? I, I, I worry so much about this in our day and time because there are many, many Christians, many Many gospel preachers who will start talking about, about the concept of social drinking or drinking uh, as long as it's not in, in, in excess, drinking in moderation, and, and talking about how this is not something that is dangerous. Time and again we see the danger of it, and God warns about it time and again. I think there are, are some direct prohibitions against it in 1 Peter chapter 4 and other places, but, but just think about this for a moment, especially with leaders. And, and what was happening here, the two leading uh, offices in Israel at this time, the, we are told uh, here that the kings, or the prophets, excuse me, and the priests, so the religious leaders, those who were supposed to have words from God, those who were supposed to be servicing God, they were characterized by drunkenness, and that drunkenness, that intoxication, that, that drink that they were drinking was causing them, in the latter part of verse 7, to err in vision and stumble in judgment. Okay? So let's think about that a moment. Let's just be careful in knowing that intoxicating drink, and, and when you talk about it today, there is, there is nothing uh, that, uh, that is not alcohol. I, I, I suppose maybe kombucha. Have you heard of kombucha? I hadn't heard about it until I, I was watching something and, and, and I, I heard kombucha has alcohol in it. I said, oh, does it? You know, does it? Because some people are drinking it and all. And, and I looked and it said there's not, there's, there's some fermentation, but there's really, unless you do it homemade and you don't do it right, there's really not intoxication. There's not enough alcohol to, to be able to impact you at all. So what, we, can, we can set kombucha aside, but you're talking about wine coolers and you're talking about beers and and fortified wine and hard liquor and all of those kinds of things uh, that, you know, uh, what's that, hard lemonade or, or uh, Arnold Palmer and Arnold Palmer or, you know, I think a lot of those are alcoholics. So you, get, you can talk about everything they do these days and that's intoxicating drink is what it is. Well, what does intoxicating drink do? It causes you to err in your vision and then you stumble in your judgment. There is one reason for individuals to drink and that is because they like it. Okay? So they like the taste. Do you like anything else? Any other taste do you like and enjoy? Do you like sweet tea? Do you like Coca-Cola? Do you like grape juice? Do you like something else? Okay? Because there is that second reason why people drink, and that is, and by, by the way, from what I understand, it's a kind of an acquired taste. The first time you drink it, whoa, it's, it's alcohol. But the second thing is because of what it does to you, how it impacts you. Makes you feel good. Makes you feel loose. I, I golf from time to time, and I have seen on videos and, and from a distance on the golf course, not had to play with anyone who was falling down drunk, but they drink, and they drink the entire four hours that they're, and by the last hole, if they swing, they fall down. You know, it's just they can't even stand up. Now, they're having a blast, and they're enjoying themselves, and they'll tell you it makes them golf better, but they can't even stand up by the end of the round because they've gotten intoxicated. It, it affects their vision, it affects their judgment, their stumbling judgment. So listen to this, Proverbs 31, 
verses 4 and 5. You may remember, these are the words that King Lemuel, who wrote that part of the book of Proverbs, received from his mother. This is what his mother told him. Maybe nobody else can tell the king this, but his mama can tell him what he needs to hear. So this is what she said to him in verse 4. It's not for kings, O Lemuel, it's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes, intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. So, you say, well, maybe there's nothing wrong or maybe not that wrong with drinking. You want the President of the United States to get drunk or to be drinking? Now, I'm sure he does some, and it's a part of it, but you want the king, uh, the president, the prime minister, you want them making decisions about nuclear bombs and, and who to ally with nations and all of these kinds of things with judgment that is distorted or affected by intoxicating drink? You don't want that, do you? Now notice this application in 1 Timothy chapter 3. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine. Is that so leaders of the church, okay? Spiritual leaders. Doesn't it make sense? The prophets and the priests are the ones that led them astray. Leadership is not a place for wine. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, and not greedy for money. Not a good thing for leaders in the church. It's not good for the king or for princes. It's not good for... So why is it good for you? That's the question that I would like to ask. You lead your family. You have an important place that you, you have in your family or in the Lord's church or, or, or uh, the relationship you sustain with the world. So can it be said that it is a, not a smart thing to live a life of intoxication or uh, live a life drinking this hard liquor or these intoxicating beverages? And isn't it dangerous? And that's just the, that's as far as I'll go with the point in, in the lesson today, but it's something I want you to keep in mind. Yes, Dennis. That's a good point. Yeah, so it's, it's, not, it's not in airline pilots to drink either. <laughs> or it shouldn't be. <laughs> not be given one. Yeah. Gotcha. Pilot? Okay, good. 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 I, I'll appreciate that. That's kind of smart, I think. Yeah, that's good. All right, any questions at all that we want to go on? Okay, we just got just a couple of minutes. I just want to remain to uh, look at the... Well, actually, I don't think we'll be able to have time to do it because... Uh, the second part of this 28th chapter, and we'll, we'll touch on it next week quickly before we go on, has to do with uh, Zion with regard to Jerusalem. Um, in Isaiah 28, the latter part of it, and there is the reference to the precious cornerstone uh, that is found here. So they're trying to, um, to, to establish their foundation and their standing by making those political alliances to protect themselves. And here is the call. You're making a mistake, Isaiah says. You need to trust in God because the sure foundation, the precious cornerstone, uh, the one who are tr true believers, they're going to place their trust in that. And that is a foreshadowing, as he puts here, or a shadowing of the Christ himself because the text of 1 Peter chapter 2 and vor me, verses 4 through 8, they quote in part in different aspects of it, different aspects of this particular um, passage of Scripture. You'll remember that when we talked about the Messianic prophecies of Isaiah, that there are more than twice the references and allusions uh, in the New Testament to the book of Isaiah than any other book with regard to Messianic prophecies, and this is one of them. And we want to kind of cover those whenever we come across them, and, and we're just out of time to do that the way I wanted to. So we're going to read 1 Peter 2, 4, and 8. And uh, we're also going to read that, that uh, text there in the latter part of chapter 28, and verses 16 and 17 next week and make that point and just describe that point a little bit more. So if you want some reading to do before now and next week, Isaiah 28, 16 and 17, and then 1 Peter 2 
in verses 4 through 8. And then we'll, we'll just pick up uh, with uh, continuing on in chapters 29 and going down through the remainder of this. We're going to kind of do the same thing. We'll go a little bit more quickly through some of it than we do others. Um, you know, we want to get through this before the before a year is up. I think uh, Justin is willing to teach in, in the next semester. Maybe we'll get finished by the end of that. But appreciate very much everyone's kind of attention today, and we'll pick up with, uh, with that section, Jerusalem, and how Jerusalem uh, made a mistake uh, there in Isaiah 28 and verse 16 in our study next week.